for you. Emotional incontinence. You have urinary incontinence. No, I said emotional incontinence. Sorry, I hate fucking crying. As Western civilization collapses, which it is, so does our ability to deal with minor day-to-day -day struggles, without breaking down and wallowing in a pitiful puddle of our own self-indulgent fragility. We're indoctrinated with emotional incontinence by television. America has been collectively turned into Kim Kardashian's cry face. I've just been like so unhappy. She don't think I feel bad. The masses overdose on reality TV, thinking that it's actually reality and then mimic it in their own lives. The more insipid sentimentality displayed on TV, the more it manifests itself in the here and now. Vacuous people live their lives vicariously through celebrities and television, then base their own personalities on that. Reality TV doesn't reflect reality. It contrives reality. It relentlessly broadcasts the message that ostentatious OTT, often dumb, displays of emotion are to be imitated. Kick me off, how about that? Sorry, I didn't get that. Are you speaking English? People breaking down and sobbing because Gordon Ramsay had his team renovate their restaurant. A stunning fresh coat of paint. Oh my God! We've updated the upholstery. Oh New plates. <laughs> I'm fucking believable. No! You're not supposed to cry over a paint job and some new furniture. The same is true of YouTube. YouTubers are rewarded for emotional incontinence and oversharing. The try not to cry challenge. Constantly crying and whining about their drama and their breakups. The viewers lap it up like water in the desert then ape their behavior. Oh, why is everyone crying? I'm such a baby. Last year, Twitter users revealed what made them cry. The answers included people who cried at not being able to fit all the things they wanted to in their bag, getting the wrong sauce with chicken McNuggets, and crying at a picture of a man because he looked like he was nice. <laughs> the floodgates of emotional incontinence are also flung open whenever a celebrity dies. Why do people People whimper and sob over dead celebrities they never knew, and in many cases rarely even thought about until they died. Does this betray another form of weakness, our inability to process the concept of death itself? Are mass public outpourings of grief and canonization of dead celebrities a sign that humanity has never been more afraid? of its own mortality. A sign that excessive emoting is making us both more insecure and more insincere. As Theodore Dalrymple wrote, we live in an age of emotional incontinence, when they who emote the most are believed to feel the most. As we become increasingly atomized by the breakdown of the family structure and its replacement by this empty late stage capitalist corporate monoculture, authentic expressions of private love have been replaced by spurious public displays of counterfeit emotion. Why are we constantly told that there's a stigma around depression? That there's a stigma around expressing emotion? There isn't! The opposite is true. It's constantly drilled into us that depression is normal and that emotional incontinence and oversharing is to be encouraged. You can barely go two minutes without seeing someone drone on about how depressed they are on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. This has two consequences. It trivializes actual depression and it incentivizes weak-mindedness. And I'm not saying you should never cry or express emotion, especially people who have experienced real trauma and have PTSD like injured war veterans or female rape victims. But please, save it for something that actually deserves that response. Otherwise, you cheapen the entire range of human emotion. You limit the human capacity when it's necessary to deal with actual grief and suffering. Our ancestors lived through the Great Depression, famine, war, poverty. They didn't get morose over someone not replying to their WhatsApp message within 10 minutes. <coughs> and that meant they were able to handle real trauma better because they had a sense of perspective. Dalrymple again, where once emotional restraint and self-control were admired, now it's emotional incontinence that the British aim for. It's as if they had undergone potty training in reverse. The English have been persuaded that emotions are like pus in an abscess. 
if they are not released by screaming and shouting, hugging and crying, wailing and raging, and the more publicly the better, they will turn inwards and cause emotional septicemia. The person who controls himself is not only a figure of fun, but a traitor to his own best interests. We've got it better than anyone in human history. Our emotional indulgences are catered for like never before, and yet depression continues to rise, especially amongst young people. The more we talk about depression, the more depressed people become. This constant expectation and encouragement of emotional incontinence is worsening our mental health. Emotional incontinence has also been driven by an explosion in narcissism. People regard it as a good thing to express themselves, irrespective of whether they've anything to express. Narcissism is facilitated by social media. Nice job, team. The more information we reveal about ourselves, the more dopamine hits we can expect to receive from likes, shares, and comments. Yet we can never seem to compete with that one friend whose Instagram feed just seems like they're having that bit more fun, which in turn makes us more depressed. Society's endorsement of emotional incontinence is training us to behave like we have a mental disorder. Seriously, it's a mental disorder. pseudo bulbar effect a type of emotional disturbance characterized by uncontrollable episodes of crying and or laughing or other emotional displays. It's a neurological disorder. The lighter form is called mood lability, an emotional response that is irregular or out of proportion to the situation at hand. It's a facet of borderline personality disorder. Why is our culture normalizing? Borderline personality disorder. Why are we being convinced to embrace mental illness? Because it's easier to control and coerce a population that's permanently trapped in a heightened state of emotional frailty than one that has a strong cerebral constitution. Because the people who can't control their own disposition then become control freaks themselves. If people can't control their own emotions, then they have to start trying to control other people's behavior. Because in an age of vapid consumerism and an eroding sense of identity, appropriating afflictions provides a facsimile of meaning. Why call yourself maladjusted when you can be an autist? Why call yourself a fussy eater when you can be gluten intolerant? Why call yourself a pathetic, weak-minded crybaby when you can just be comfortable with externalizing your emotions. <laughs> Men being browbeaten out of their toxic masculinity is also creating a generation of soylent drinking, emotionally incontinent, blubbering manlets. Soy boy. And again, I'm not talking about people who have experienced real suffering. I'm talking about people who cry about not being able to get their eyebrows to look the same. Now I know what you're thinking. Paul. You're just a heartless, miserable bastard. Yeah, and... <laughs> I simply am not there. Actually, no. I'm a stoic. I'm not making all this stuff up off the top of my head. I'm not regurgitating some stereotypical stiff upper lip basic bitchery. This is called stoicism a branch of philosophy that stretches back to the 3rd century BC. Stoicism is the antidote to emotional incontinence. Stoicism is a realistic alternative to nihilism, and I'll devote an entire video to it in the near future. Look, if we've reached the point where people are bringing emotional support pigs onto airplanes... <laughs> Because they're so wretchedly uncomfortable with their own emotions, they can't get through a three-hour flight. Maybe time to ask if our society is overly emotional. <laughs> if we've reached the point where people are so devoid of any sense of mental stability, they claim to have 400 different personalities, some of which are children, meaning they can't even take care of their own basic needs. Maybe time to ask if the parameters of what society accepts as a genuine mental illness have been stretched too far. Maybe time to ask if our obsession with emotional incontinence is changing us in ways that can never be reversed. Please click the big red button to subscribe. It really helps me when you do that. And click the bell to allow notifications so you never miss a new video.